Okay, uh, before we get started, I just want to take this opportunity to um, let everyone know that uh, we're going to continue uh, the semester uh, using an online format uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. And this is not going to be as difficult as what it would be for a lot of other classes because uh, simply we've prepared for this in the past relative to things like snow days and that sort of stuff where we would do this kind of thing. Uh, we're going to have to scale it up a little bit. There will be some issues with uh, exams, quizzes, that kind of stuff. But overall, <clears throat> this should be a fairly easy transition. Now, this week we're going to keep it simple. This week uh, you're going to have your video here to watch of your lecture. You'll have your lab assignments and things like that to do. Uh, I'm going to... Um, make it a little simpler this week um, as far as uh, what you need to do. Um, I went back through and going back to like week chapter three or so, um, all the labs and ESRI trainings and stuff like that that we've done uh, that had already been closed out because of the, you know, past the time limit, I've extended those, opened those back up so that if you didn't submit something, didn't turn something in, you can go back and do so now. If you missed the deadline and you sent something to me in an email, um, my policy is that I don't ever accept anything in email because it's easy for me to lose it and not get the grade in. So if you've sent me anything this semester that you did after the fact, uh, after a deadline for an assignment to be turned in had passed thinking, well, maybe he'll look at this and give me some points. I've opened a lot of that stuff back up. Your responsibility is to go back and submit those things that you're missing. If you're not sure what you're missing, check out your gradebook. I basically went through and graded up everything that was there today. Uh, even went over your proposals. A um, handful of them were spot on. A uh, handful of them were way off. Most of them were about halfway there. The proposal is not a complicated thing. Uh, we had a nice... Uh, uh, representative sample in the uh, slides, I believe it was, or the PowerPoint, I, or a PDF, I can't remember what it was I was using when we covered it in class, but it's material that you have access to. It's in Canvas. Uh, go back, take a look at it, read my comments. What I did was on your submission below that, there's an opportunity a box there where I can make comments. And so I'll give you some feedback. Again, it's brutal, it's straightforward, it's not trying to candy coat it, make you feel good about your work. It's to make you point it out to you what it is that I want you to change. Um, and the reason is I want you to read those, make those changes, and then when I look at the next version of your proposal, I want it to be perfect. Uh, and by perfect, I mean exactly what I'm looking for, which is what I showed you in class, which is what I'm asking for, which is not what most of you did. So um, take the opportunity. Uh, you have two chances on the proposal. Everyone that had submitted one already, I graded. If you hadn't submitted one, you got a zero. Uh, if you got a zero or you were just completely wrong um, and did nothing um, near what was looking for and you got a zero, it really doesn't matter because what's going to happen is I'm going to take the final score you get and you have two opportunities. So if you've submitted something, you can now fix it and resubmit it and then I'll grade it again. As for everyone else, if you haven't submitted anything, then you need to make sure you do a better job, submit it, and I'll take a look at it. If we still have significant issues between what you're submitting and what I'm looking for, I may go back over it again or bump it up to allow three submissions. But for now, I think everyone can fix it by the next go-round. So um, the plan uh, moving forward is tonight I'm going to talk about uh, map overlays and geoprocessing. And then next week, um, I will move part of this week's lecture, which was going to be uh, part of the project-based stuff in the next week. it will give me a little more time to practice and utilize this uh, Zoom uh, technology that we have here. And basically what it will allow me to do is use my computer here at home and I can do the kind of demonstrations that I wanted to do in class next week for this and you'll be able to see my computer screen on your computer screen. And we'll be able to interact back and forth where you can, if you have a microphone, 
uh, set up on your computer, you can um, talk to me as I'm doing this, or uh, we might set up a, a message board where you can type in questions. We'll figure out what works best between now and then, and we'll give that a shot next week, along with a, a lecture just like this, a video lecture that you can watch anytime you want. But next week's going to be critical because next week you need to be online during class period because that's when I'm going to do the, the demo part. Uh, I'm going to start it at basically at about 7.05. That'll give us about a five-minute window uh, to make sure everyone's on. And then we'll take a shot at it and see how it works. Uh, if it doesn't work well, then I will uh, convert my demonstration into PowerPoint slides and make a video and upload it later. One way or the other, you're going to get all the information either in still frames or in live action with me telling you about it as we go along. And we will, in time, um, uh, work at and get better at uh, these means of communicating back and forth in a timely fashion if we uh, as we get particularly closer to the end of the semester when we're dealing more with the projects, um, you know, we may have to do some uh, video conferencing or phone conferencing or something like that with one or multiple ones of you if you need uh, office hour time. Uh, basically, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to keep my office hours to be as open as possible. And so if you need to talk to me and there's a time that's good for you, let me know, and I will try to, uh, well, I'll see if I can fit that into my schedule if it's outside of my normal office hours time. And what we'll have to do, because we can't actually physically meet not in the office, is we can set up a Zoom conference um, where uh, we can meet one-on-one -on -one in that environment. And that's the way that we got to do it, folks. So uh, it's not the best uh, solution, but it's the solution we're dealing with. So in the meantime, um, just sit back and enjoy uh, this rousing lecture. Uh, this will be lecture part one, and then uh, spatial analysis one will be uh, lecture part two. And um, hopefully this will start to piece together some of what, what we're looking to do as far as our projects. And uh, uh, it will all become more and more clear as we move along. And like I said, um, we'll make the best of this situation. So if you have questions, uh, things in the video you don't quite understand, send me an email. Um, I will be checking those daily and try to get back to you in as timely a fashion as I can to uh, help answer your questions so that we don't let uh, misunderstandings or uh, things that you didn't quite get linger any longer than we have to. All right, let's get started. So what is map overlay? Um, Map overlay is basically just a physical way, uh, if you think about it, of laying the layers of data on top of one another. And it joins features based on common locations. And what's interesting is that unlike a lot of the other techniques we've covered so far to join data, when we use a map overlay, anytime features overlap but the boundaries don't coincide, it forces a one-to-one -one cardinality, and so it effectively splits things. And so the examples here we have is geology and land ownership polygon layers. And when you lay those together, every line and every boundary on every polygon uh, is transferred to the final output. And so what happens is if, if two polygons uh, overlap one another, all the possible combinations of is it in polygon A, is it in polygon B, is it in polygon A and B are created. And with this one-to-one -one cardinality, each new polygon has all the attributes that's associated with that spatial location, whether it's just in this example from geology or just from ownership or if it's from both. So why do we do it? Um, well, things like spatial joins work really good if the cardinality is right. But Whenever you have um, anything other than a one-to-one -one type uh, relationship, um, you end up averaging data. And that's not always what we want. And sometimes we don't want the data across an entire area from one data set, but only for a part of another. And so when we enforce the one-to-one -one cardinality and we use the overlay function, it gives us new features that are split based on the boundaries. And so, for example, if you look in the image on the right where you have these rivers, it will uh, 
create segments of the rivers relative to these county boundaries so that literally you can measure the length of the river in the county as opposed to just knowing the length of that line segment because that line segment might be much longer than just one county. So what are the problems with spatial joins? Uh, when you gather statistics, for example, it gathers it across the whole thing and averages it. We don't want that. We want one-to-one -one cardinality. If you look at the light blue lines crossing multiple things, it would summarize that information and give it to you. If we use a spatial overlay function, it will cut that blue line up into segments as it goes across each of those counties. And then for each county, you're looking at a one-to-one -one cardinality, and so it would have the data associated with the county and associated with that segment of the line just like this. And so that by splitting those features, it effectively makes the one-to-one -one and it makes it much more useful. And this is just an example of showing how not only does it do it with the feature itself, but it does it with the uh, attributes as well. And so everything gets updated according to this new one-to-one -one cardinality and these new resegmented lines or these new uh, polygon shapes. Ultimately, um, this is just a way of taking these complex data sets and integrating them together in a much better fashion. So let's look at some of the types of overlays that are out there. Uh, point and polygon, line and polygon, and polygon on polygon are the first ones that we're going to look at. Point in polygon overlay is used to assign polygon attributes to the points. So this is real simple. This is basically just like a spatial join. You've got a point. It follows over a particular polygon. The attributes of the polygon are attached to the point. Voila. Uh, points and polygons attaches the land use to the schools in this example, just like uh, it would if you did a spatial join. Line and polygon. This is used to assign polygon attributes to the lines. So now you have lines that cross multiple polygons. And so if you did a spatial join, it would have to combine that data because you're joining many things to one. But what happens is in our setup, um, it effectively splits those line segments at the polygon boundary so that each segment of the line is only within a single polygon boundary. And then it has all the attributes of that polygon associated with that segment like this. Here we're looking at examples of streams and geologic units and so now each section of the stream has the associated information relative to the underlying geology and that is then updated in the attribute table. Polygon on polygon is the more complicated if you will sort of scenario but this does a really good job of explaining it. Two layers geology and slope class and if you lay one over top of the other it looks like the thing on the right. But what we've kind of done here is taken it really honestly a step further. And so on the right, um, now everywhere that there was a boundary of a polygon on either data set, the boundary exists in the new one. So that for every location, you have uh, a one-to-one -one relationship. The steps to overlay is pretty straightforward. Uh, it combines features and it produces, this is the key part, all possible new features. It combines attribute tables and it brings the original values from each table and assignment to each new feature. And the new spatial data set is created with features and an attribute table. So it doesn't modify or change or impact your original data sets. It gives you a new data set made up of everything from the other two data sets. And here's something where they're looking at the values of what you would see, for example, in the same location in the two different layers. And when you go to the uh, new data set, it has information from both. So there's different types of these overlay functions. And the first one we're going to talk about is union. Union combines all the features. Uh, and this is basically polygon on polygon overlay only. So when you do a union, you take two polygons, it keeps everything. Another one is something called intersect. Intersect combines and keeps common features. So if we look at the two illustrations below, now intersect works on points, lines, or polygons, not just polygon on polygon like the union. But we're going to look at polygon examples here at the bottom. If we have a union, we have a box, and we have the double circles, when we put them together, and you get all the possible combinations in the output. When we have an intersect of a box and a double circle, you only get the area that's common to both, which would be the double circles with the lines from the box. 
Make sense? Good. Uh, another way of looking at it here, they use these clever colors. Intersect keeps the common areas. Union keeps everything. Another example of union. Another example of intersect. Let's talk about hazard mapping. Um, you got residential areas, you've got a particular formation that could be of interest. Maybe it's because of radon gas or something like that. And so if you're looking for true hazard areas, it's places that are residential but on the um, pitchy formation. And the areas in the right uh, map that are in the purple meet both criteria. You can also use this as a means of doing habitat analysis. Uh, you can use queries to isolate features from intersects, from inputs. You can uh, do uh, uh, intersect selection to find common areas. Lots of different ways. This is a version of what we're going to do. Um, you can just do the overlay functions and put things together. Uh, we're going to do some additional calculations, but basically, uh, at its purest, this is the main course, if you will, of this uh, modeling dinner. Here we have elevation, and we have limestone, and we have conifer, and they're trying to map out this endangered snail species habitat, and it typically is above a certain elevation, and it has to be on a certain kind of geology, and it has to be in a certain type of vegetation, and when you find the places that meet all the criteria, boom, that's the habitat. And that's exactly what we're going to do with the flying squirrels. It's elevation, and it's land cover. So we only have two data sets, but same process. Intersecting different geometries is something that comes up from time to time uh, because you can do intersects on not just polygon on polygon, but you can do polygon on um, polygon and then select different outputs. For example, if you have two polygons and you want to intersect, like in the top picture, you can get the area that's in both as a polygon, or you could get it as the line around the outside, or as in the two points where the polygon boundaries intersect one another. So, uh, I thought I was going to make it through without yawning, sorry. There's lots of different ways that you can select information and change what you get from your intersections in terms of your output. So, um, the limitations are really only based on how limited your creativity is. Here's some examples. Um, we've got a road network and we've drawn this area. I like to think of it as there's a bank in the middle. This is all the roads the bank was robbed. We know that um, the police response time limits the distance the bank robbers can travel in a certain amount of time, and so they have to be within inside that distance of that circle. So what does that tell us? Well, um, if we keep the roads, it tells us all the possible locations where these criminals could be traveling. If we do it as points, <coughs> Excuse me, it literally tells us exactly how many police units we have to have to cover all the escape routes. Some more overlay operations. Let's just look at a summary here. Um, we have clip, erase, intersect, and union. These are the big four. Uh, clip and erase, we've talked about those in the past in class. When you clip something, you basically get the cookie. When you erase something, you get the cookie dough minus the cookie. So we have an input, which we're going to call the cookie dough, and we have an overlay, which is going to be our cookie cutter. And so if we do a clip, we get a an output that is essentially the part of the input that occupies the same space as your overlay. When we do the erase, we get the input minus the overlay. Now, when we do that, with those features and those operations, clip and erase, the attributes aren't joined. But when we do intersect and union, that's a different story. Intersect gives us the area that is common to the input and the overlay, but it keeps all the possible combinations based on the uh, physical geometry within those objects or those polygons. Union keeps everything, everything common, everything in both data sets, not just the stuff that's common. And so it gives you some ideas of how they're different. Length and area changes. We've talked about this in the past. Um, I'm going to talk about it again. Clip and erase can change the lengths or areas of features or boundaries, just like when you project data, that changes it. 
Geodatabase feature classes have a field called shape underscore length and shape underscore area, and those fields are automatically updated in feature classes in Geodatabases. That is it. In every other situation, if it is an area or a length or any kind of geometric field, they're not updated. Whether it's a shape file or a geodatabase, it doesn't matter. The only ones that are ever updated are shape underscore area and shape underscore length in feature classes in geodatabases. That's it.